wedding anniversary Sunday. So to those who are married here, uh, happy anniversary. Okay, can you please meet those married couples? There's in the side there. So our message is for all, not just for married couples, of course. Our message is intended also for those who are preparing. Uh, that is why, you know, this uh, slight wedding ambience here, there are candles around. Okay? Now, if you're buying the, the, a, a, you buy a, a sacred marriage, uh, you can have it tonight if you want. Okay, you really, if you want. Okay? So, so that we can uh, join such marriages with, with our renewal vows. Okay? Now, not all of you are, are uh, members here, but this is something that we do uh, every year. And uh, part of the mission is that there's a portion after the message we're in. I will be uh, calling the months of the year. And if, if your wedding anniversary uh, falls on that uh, particular month, then you may come and give your special Thanksgiving offering to the Lord for your marriage, right? So, uh, we will be doing that and I will also be showcasing uh, different trees in the Bible, okay? Because trees in the Bible are significant. They are not just there as, you know, part of the backdrop. But, uh, I believe trees have significant meaning. In fact, trees are used to symbolize life. So I believe that with the tree of the month, it will also somehow uh, reflect okay, your marriage. Alright, so how are you tonight? Are you good? Are you blessed? Are you happy that you're here? Okay, then please stand your reading and smile to those people beside you. Smile. And uh, we are quite early today. Uh, we made the point that by 5.30 we start with a praise of worship. And so uh, we encourage you to please to come early so that you will not be late. Again, the worship service begins with the opening prayer and the praise of worship. For some, they say, Ay, katakanta ka rin? Wala pa message? No. It's not katakanta. Uh, the worship starts with the singing. Amen? Amen? Worship is all about singing. So if you're not singing to the Lord, you are not, you have not given your uh, worship. Uh, you know, the Bible says that we offer to Him the sacrifice of our lips. So if you are not singing, you have not given the sacrifice that God does. Alright, so you have your Bibles with you. Okay, you have your Bibles there. Let's open it to our text found in uh, Ephesians, right? Ephesians chapter chapter 5. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse 21. Ephesians 5, verse 21, towards the end of the chapter, right? May I request everyone now to please stand as we read the word of God. Ephesians 21, or Ephesians 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why submit to your husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
After all, no one ever needed his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the reading of your word. We pray, Father, that you are now about to speak to us, and so we ask that you will open our hearts and minds. Remove anything, Lord, that we will be strong, that we will be stored. Help us, Father, to have a clear understanding of your word tonight so that when we go home, we go home, thought, blessed, equipped, transformed. And we ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit as we listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our seats. All right, so we are going to talk about marriage tonight. Okay, by the way, who are married couples here? Can I see some hands? Okay, legally married. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right? So maybe some of you are saying, you know, uh, I'm married to this person illegally. Okay? Of course, uh, we have to adhere to the, the laws of our nation. You cannot just become a husband or a wife to someone without uh, the law. Alright, so this is part five of our series and we've been talking about the spirit-filled life. Now, uh, let me just uh, a little bit give you a background on how we started this. Now, when we started the series, we said that for a Christian to be truly a Christian, to, for a Christian to follow the Word of God, for a Christian to be a witness to the world, for us to obey His commandments, we need to be filled by the Spirit. Why? Because on our own, human as we are, we have the corrupt nature within. We have the fallen nature. Say fallen. Fallen. Okay. The fallen nature, that's the nature that we all inherited from Adam and Eve. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, all posterity, they all children coming out from them, they were born with that sinful nature. Okay? with a sinful nature. But then, when you, when you and I trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, okay, the Spirit did something. Right? Why? Because the result of the, the sinful nature is death. The result of the sinful nature is spiritual separation from God. So, we, we are no longer object of God's love, but objects of His wrath of his anger because we are sinners. But when we trust in Jesus Christ as Lord, you see, the Holy Spirit healed us. Alright? He did something. Okay? He transformed our hearts, forgiven our sins, wiped all our sins you know, from beginning to that portion. Right? And so we are a, a practically a new creation according to the Bible. Amen? Remember, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Okay, say, I'm a new creation. Okay, we are a new creation. But then, even if we are now a new creation, even if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, we are still humans, right? Okay, you are still a human being. And human as we are, the old sinful nature that is in our body, in our flesh, is still at work. Okay? And it is still trying to control our system, our thoughts, our eyes, our words. Now without the filling of the Holy Spirit, we still, you know, we still love to do those bad habits, those lifestyle habits of the old sinful life, 
That is why it is necessary that we must be filled with the Spirit. You know why? Because it is only through the control of the power of the Spirit that we can that we can fight you know, the struggle against the old sinful nature. And we talk about the spirit-filled fathers, we talk about the spirit-filled women. That what characterizes the spirit-filled women? What are the three S's? A Christian woman must be submissive. Right. Second? What's second? A sober. Okay, or you should have the spirit of sobriety in moderation. Okay, and I notice there's an effect after the sermon last Sunday now. Suddenly you become so dignified. Huh? The makeup are not too much, but I could still see some mini skirts, <coughs> borderline micro-mini. Okay, remember? What you wear and how you project yourself speak so much of what kind of spirit you have inside. Okay? So sometimes what spirit you have inside? Is that the spirit of Jesus? Or that's the spirit of the world? Okay? Remember, if you're a Christian, you are loved by the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. What else? So, submissive so over again. Okay. A Christian woman has a soft, quiet spirit. Okay? Women say soft. So do you have that, you have that, that quiet spirit inside of you? Right? So we need that. Now Paul proceeds talking about the couple, okay, the institution of marriage. But what is marriage in our days now? What do you think you know, is the media? You know? doing in our marriage. Like for example, many ceremonies may go like this with of course with the technology that we have. Do you promise to love and to cherish each other both online and offline? So it changes now the you know the the wording in the ceremony. Oh look at this. And do you also promise not to share your password with anyone of culture? So how important is a password now to, to husband and wife? Or here's another one. And you, Jennifer, promise not to interrupt the ceremony again to check your email. Okay. I think, no? Or like this. I now pronounce your husband and wife. You may update your Facebook status. So before, after pronouncing husband and wife, you may not kiss the bride. But before kissing, change the... Okay, so... What's usually the status when you are married? Mm -hmm. Huh? It's a minute ago. Married. Okay, but if you're going through some tough times in your marriage life, it's complicated. Complicated. Okay. But what's another one? If you are having a relationship with someone who is so complicated, what's there? Confidential. Confidential. <laughs> okay. Alright. What's, what's, what's the other word? Stable. Unstable. Okay, meaning the relationship is unstable. Alright. Here's a, here's a woman married to a or married a very old man. Okay, can, can you read this? Yeah, let me read this for you. She plans on living happily ever after the funeral. Living happy ever after the funeral. Okay, because you know, the guy is old. Or look at this. Uh, I don't know if this is... Uh, most of us here are, are, are singles, but this is a common thing in the in, in a man and husband and wife. Okay? Hi, could you give me the silent treatment until about 8.30? So the silent treatment, you cannot relate to this, but usually that's how you know, husbands and wives you know, fight. The wife suddenly gives a silent treatment, right? But those silent treatments are actually beneficial if you guys, husbands, love to watch something. You don't want to be disturbed by your wife. Or maybe, oh, fire window, okay? Maybe your, your marriage life is so boring that 
before the when it's reception is over, you are already what? You are asleep. Okay, so what's the condition of your marriage today? I'm talking to the married couples here. Right? What's the condition of your marriage life? Now, do you want to have a happy, healthy, and holy marriage? Yes? Because a happy, healthy, and holy marriage is not automatic. It is not a natural thing, you know? It's not that you marry the right person and then expect that it's going to be a happy. No! A happy, a healthy, and a holy marriage is what? It is intentional. It must be intentional. You have to exert effort. Why? Because we are now in a world, we are now in a culture that is trying to change, trying to pervert the issue, trying to change the picture of what biblical Christian marriage ought to be. Like for example, marriages today are so casual that if you are no longer happy with your partner, you can simply say, you know what, I'm tired of you. I want, I want a new deal. And then they sign papers, they pay, and then that's all. It's so casual. Like, if you're so in love with your wife, and then suddenly here's another beautiful woman in your life, okay? And remember, our speaker said instead of calling it adultery, we just call it an, an affair. Right? Or, in another picture, which is very common now, and bills are already starting to be passed, and I hope, God forbid, this will not be common law in the Philippines. Like, for example, when a man and another man fall in love with each other, and then wish to be solemnized and be called married couples. Or, a woman with another woman, and then calling it marriage. What is that? Now, these things show that our society is truly collapsing. Why? Because the very core, the very basic unit of society, which is the marriage between a man and a woman, is now being transformed, changed, and given a new meaning. And I want us to understand today that this is not okay for God. What I want us to learn tonight is this, that when we go out from this fellowship, you will understand what is the biblical meaning and view of marriage. And we will have a stand, okay? We don't become judgmental people. That's not the kind of thing I want us to become. We don't want to become judgmental. But we know what is right and what is wrong. And hopefully, we will choose to do what is right. Because in our society today, everything now is relative. You know, if it applies to you, well, it may not apply to me. Maybe what is true to you is not true to me. That's true to wisdom. Okay? Relative. But we Christians, we Christians who believe in the Word of God, we believe in the absolute truths of God. Amen? We believe that the Bible was given so that there's harmony, there's a standard, so that there's peace and order in our society. And so, let me share to you this evening, based on our text, the three R's of a spirit-filled marriage. Right? The three R's of a spirit-filled marriage. Number one, a spirit-filled marriage reveres. Okay, what's, what's the other word for the word revere? Respect. Respect, what else? Okay, in the Bible, the, the most common synonym of the word revere is fear. Okay? But it's not that when you fear, like as if you're, you fear of a fear of ghost, no, no, not that kind of fear, but it's reverential fear. It's the kind of fear when when you are facing someone who is of high position, okay? Like for example, if the president would come and you were asked to talk to him, it's not that you're afraid of him as, you know, as a monster or a murderer, no. But you have that fear because he's somewhat very, what? 
very high. That's the kind of reference we're talking here. A spirit-filled marriage reveres Christ as its designer and builder. Okay? Now, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, this is how Paul started his talk about marriage. He starts with verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the foundation, that's the bedrock. There is harmony, there is love, there is understanding in, a, in a, a man, a woman, in a context of marriage, when both submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Okay? That is why, ladies, it's so important that you marry a Christian because you know that the man fears God. And if that man fears God, you know, you're confident that he is going to lead the family. But if you marry someone who don't believe in God or, you know, just ignore God, that's dangerous, that's risky, right? But when I was somebody shared to me, uh, in reaction to the several messages that we have had about spiritual that the pastor, please also tell, you know, the, the, the congregation, okay, that every time I say you, you should marry a Christian, right? It doesn't mean that the people outside are are not, you know, are not potential what potential to become Christians. What I'm saying is this: you just don't know that maybe your office mate, maybe your classmate, or maybe your friend, you know, his heart or her heart is simply just waiting for you know the Holy Spirit to touch. So. Just share the gospel, and you do not know that you're the one God is going to use, you know, to bless the soul of your friend, and that she will or he will become a Christian. But basic is this: for a marriage to work, there must be reverence for Christ. Now, how do we show our reverence for Christ in marriage? Now, we need to go back to Jesus' view of marriage in the Bible. Okay? So one time, Jesus Christ was, was tested by the Pharisees. Okay? Matthew 19. So can you please go to Matthew chapter 19? Okay? That is why you need to bring your Bibles because if you don't bring your Bible, it's going to be boring. Alright? Matthew 19. He was tested by the Pharisees. The Pharisees were asking, is it lawful? Is it lawful for, for anyone, for any man to divorce you know, his wife for any reason? Okay? Who did not divorce? The same question that a lot of Christians ask today. Is it lawful to divorce? Or in our context here in the Philippines, is it lawful to have an annulment or a legal separation. But what are they going to have legal separation? Because a legal separation, you cannot re remarry. Okay? You cannot remarry. So everyone would go for an annulment. Okay? But what's the answer of Jesus? Here's the, here's the, the view of Christ about marriage, in which we must respect and we must uphold. Okay? Haven't you read and you replied that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? So Jesus' answer to the Pharisees is this. Like the Pharisees were asking for his opinion. What's your opinion about marriage? And that Jesus Christ, our Lord, points back to creation in Genesis chapter 2. Okay? And he's quoting here Genesis chapter 2 that in the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. And then Jesus added, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. All right, separate. And then, we find here four four points of what it means okay, to be married for Jesus. Okay? God right now with, with that person. I want you to look at that person now. 
I hope you're not talking to a same-sex person. <laughs> Alright? Look at your partner. Okay? Now question, do you like that partner of yours? Or maybe that boyfriend or girlfriend? Do you like him or her? Yes? Okay. Do you, do you love him? Yes? Uh, I think I'll work. Okay? Now, in, 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 in a casual marriage, we only ask ourselves, well, I love you, you like me, we're compatible, you know, you have money, I want money, so do you have money? I like, you know? Fine, we're fine, huh? you know? I'm looking for a young guy, a girl so, you know, we are compatible. My point is this, in our casual marriage today, God is not involved, okay? What Jesus says is this, for marriage to work, Jesus or God has to be the creator of it. In other words, we have to ask God's blessing. Lord, we have to pray, we have to ask that, Lord, Lord, is this the man you have for me, Lord? And what I'm saying is not easy. It's not easy. There has to be a lot of, you know, spiritual, you know, meditation and asking, Lord, is he really the one for me? Why? Because it doesn't matter, listen to this, if it takes you six months to think and pray and ask for God, okay, don't worry even if it's two years, rather than suffer for the rest of your genital life. It was a lot of people that we know are already into it. And for your information, my counseling on problematic marriages now is really increasing. It shows that, you know, it's really happening. That the devil, the enemy is destroying the marriages today. And the devil is using just so many kinds, right? Women, internet, things, okay? But, you know, the devil, the devil comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now that's his point. And your marriage, don't ever think that you will not be part of the devil's target. Any one of us here, that includes me, we are all target of the devil. Okay? So we have to go to the basic, and we need to ask a question. If you're preparing for marriage, you have to ask that question, Lord, is this your will for me? Please, don't ever say your I do, you know, on your wedding day, if you have not heard God's one yes to you. Amen? God to be that God has to be the producer. Okay? And I'm not saying that all Christian marriages are doing well. Of course, doesn't mean you are you are both Christians and no problems. That's wrong. There will still be problems. Number two, the participants of marriage is very crucial. Why? Again, because society today, society today is changing the laws of God. In the Old Testament, in fact, also in the New Testament, same-sex relationship is abomination before God. It's abomination, right? And how come society can change simply because it's preference? It's very clear, the participants. When Jesus was asked about the context of marriage, he said, he made them male and female. So those are the only participants in marriage. Any other relationship that is not a male and a female should not be called a marriage. How dare them use that word, that sacred word, and apply it to something that is sacrilegious. Right? We have no right to do that. Because that's how Jesus perceived marriage. Now, question. Pastor, maybe during the time of Jesus, there were no homosexual relationships. Yes or no? You go to Exodus. There's a whole chapter. Can you please check which chapter is that? There's a whole chapter of Exodus outlining all illegal relationships. 
It's all included there. You should not have relationship with your sister. You should not have relations with your mother or your father. You should not have relations with an animal. You should not have relations with a man as with a woman. You see that? It's very clear. It's in the Bible. Okay? Now, if you're going to change one, does that mean that the others... So right now, people are starting to just choose what laws to change and what to not. Okay? If we say that a man raping, you know, his own daughter is a heinous crime, so does the other form of sexual sins. Right? So it's only for male and female. No, I want that to be clear again because we know in America there are liberal churches ordaining, you know, same sex marriages. Right? Now again, I'm not saying here that are, are we condemning them? This is nothing to do with judging. This is something to do with giving an institution to the rightful people, right? Now, if that is your choice, then so be it. But we cannot change the laws of God, right? Third, Jesus outlines also the principle of marriage. What is the principle of marriage? A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Okay? One of my cleaving. Okay? The cleaving there is the, the joining of two people. Okay? Cleaving. So, marriage is forming a new home and, you know, a lot of the problem in the Philippines is due to what? Due to married men or married children still stay in the room of their parents. Okay, no wonder there's so many medical problems over that issue. But the Bible's principle of marriage is you start your own home, okay, you marry your partner and then you start, okay, being independent. And at number four, Jesus Christ emphasized the permanence, the permanence of marriage. Jesus said, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no man separate. Okay? Now, of course, if we're going to be, you know, to really talk about this, this is going to be a long, long session. Because there are areas, there are situations in which a wife has to leave a husband. Like, for example, if the, the husband is about to kill the wife, if the husband is already so brutal and, you know, so physical, then you have to defend yourself. You have to, you know, you have to go to somewhere safe. You have to separate. There are, of course, exemptions to that, right? So those are the things. But then we must go back to the basic. Let us read Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, his builders, what? Labor in? In vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. The point of the Bible is this. If God is not the builder of your marriage, it is still to fail. So for those of you about to be married or seeking for a partner to marry, make sure that you consult first God. Amen? And for those of us who are married and, you know, we're going through some tough times in our marriage life today, it's never too late to consult the designer of marriage. Amen? Where will you go if something doesn't work with your eye? Then you go to the one who knows about it. And he's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can mend. Jesus Christ can heal. Jesus Christ can forgive. Amen? Go to the builder. Okay, so are we submitting to Christ as the builder and the designer of our marriage? Number two, a spirit-filled marriage reflects, okay, reflects the mystery of Christ and the church. Now, here's the very crux of why we cannot just change the definition of marriage. 
Here's the explanation in the Bible. Why can't we pastor? Why cannot we allow, you know, just two men falling in love and you marry them? Why? Okay, here's the point. You know why? Because the word marriage, the word marriage is a reflection of what? It's a reflection of God. And if you try to change this reflection, that's what? That's blasphemy. You know? It's like, you know what? I like to have a picture of Jesus, but then I want Jesus to look like this. You know? You know? It sounds what? It's like you are making fun of our Lord and that's what we are doing if we do not follow His, His principle of marriage because marriage after all is a reflection of what? Of Christ and the church. Look at this. Why submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife. Look at this. As Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the, the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Notice the illustration. Notice the connection of marriage and the church. Okay? Paul always emphasizes now. Wives, you know why you should submit? Because marriage is a reflection of the church and Jesus. Okay? Ang church pa ba may magbot sa gino? No. We, we submit to our Lord. And that's how Paul is saying marriage should be like that. You wives, you submit to your husbands. Why? Because that's how the church submits to the church. And again, I would say, Paul, you husbands, be a good leader to your wives. Love them. Why? Because Jesus loves the church so much. Amen? So our relationship in marriage is simply what? A reflection of Jesus and the church. Now there are four reflections that we can find here. Number one, marriage reflects what? The cross. The cross of Jesus for this church. So in, in a spirit-filled marriage, there is cross-bearing. Cross-bearing. Look at Ephesians 5.25. I'd like all the men Call the men in the house to read this with me. Go. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What kind of love? Is it just a greeting card love kind of love? It's a giving up of himself kind of love. Okay, what? How did Jesus Christ, question, how did Jesus give up himself for her? How? When he died on the cross, right? So for Jesus to show his love for the church, meaning for the redeemed people of God, for God's elect, he has to die. He has to surrender his right. He has to surrender his personal entitlement to human rights. Wala na siya nagpa human rights. He willingly submitted himself. Why? Because that's how the church needs to be loved. Right? Question. In one of my goal, husbands, that's how we are supposed to love our wives. Giving up. Question. What? What have you given up for your wives? And those of you, single men, this is good for you. Because if you're not, if right now you are not willing to give up yourself, when you say give up yourself, it speaks of your what? Your right to self what? self gratification self-enjoyment. Self you know, like for example, you know, like for example, this is part of your routine that you watch a basketball game, that you've never missed any game. That, you know, when you watch a game, the rest of the world for you stops. Until you are married. And you are no longer you, yourself, but you're one with your wife. But then your wife needs you. And this I'm, I'm not talking of just casual day, but really needs you. Now giving up cross Berry is saying, okay, honey, for all my life, nobody disturbs me when I watch basketball. Not even my parents, not even my dogs. 
Okay? Not even the mosquitoes could stop me. Okay? But because that's how Jesus loved the church, giving up of himself, well, for me, that's the least that I can give up. Okay? Can you do that? Now, question. What are those cherished, cherished, mga, sama na, rights that you have that you are willing to give up for your wife? Are you willing? Because that's the kind of love Christian men should give. Willing to give up. Like, for example, oh, for the boys, look out for the boys. Yes, it's Saturday night. But then your wife is saying, you know what, honey, I don't feel comfortable with your friends. Okay? And then it becomes, it becomes a fight. You know what, I'm to the before you came to my life, I already have this voice. You know, that is true. But you were never one with those boys. There was no even you. Okay? But it's different, why? Because in the context of marriage, what's that? The two will become one. Okay? So, a rightful, spirit-filled husband would say, Honey, I really love this. I really want to go with them. You know, I don't want to miss some you know, giving, some gigs. But you know what? Because you said so. It's not that you submit to your wife. Again, the main question, Pastor, diba? You're not, diba it's the wife that submits? Oh, oh, no. You cannot use that. Why? Because if the wife needs you there, and if the wife is not, if the wife is not comfortable with that kind of, you know, giving that you have, then that's part of the cross bearing. Well, I married you, I did not marry them. Okay? And suddenly all the guys are silent. You know? Trying to. <laughs> Alright, that's cross bearing. That's just an example. I do not know what else you could give up. Okay, when I asked this morning, Sir Jay Wall, what have you given up to your wives? No? And then one man came to be pastor at one of them, this is what I gave up for my wife. I gave up my virginity. Wow. <laughs> Meaning to say, the guy was really waiting. Praise God. We need, we need guys like that, huh? So, talaksa na Okay, number two. Number two. Marriage ought to reflect not just the cross of Jesus, but the cleansing of Christ for His church. So Jesus not only died for His church, but after dying, Jesus is what? Is daily cleansing us, changing us, transforming us into His image. Look at verse 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, and to present her to Himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish of holy and blameless. So what is Jesus doing for the church? Cleansing her with water. Now in marriage, there has to be cleansing. Okay? So now that including as a marriage, now we are going to come together. So husband and wives who are here, think of me, husband and wife. When was the last time you were? You were removing dirt together. Huh? When was the last time I got it? You know? Okay, that's sweet. And that's difficult. The washing. But of course, we know that what Jesus is talking here is not the literal washing. But the washing here, go back to verse 26, is the washing with water through the word. Amen? So in marriage, there has to be what? Cleansing of ourselves. You know what? When we met that person, when I met Charo, when Charo met me, I'm not perfect. Very far from perfect. Until now, work in progress, right? So we need to say, both the husband and the wife, they are work in progress. And how do we do that? By cleansing each other. Not with our own, you know, to look to look at it. No, not with those words. But we cleanse each other with the word of God. Amen? Are you reading the word of God regularly? Oh. 
That's how you change. You know? Now for you ladies with problematic husband, you know, it will not it will not work knocking, no, it will not work more than an invoice. Okay? Pray for that husband and read that word for that husband. It's the word that change. That is why if your okay, if your boyfriend, ladies, no single ladies here, if your boyfriend doesn't want to go with you to church up here, it's already a sign that that guy, you know, that guy is resistant. That guy doesn't really count your faith as important. Because after all, your bringing them here doesn't mean that you are going to convert them. Again, that's not our point. We don't bring people here and make them, you know, Protestants. Again, I don't care if they remain, you know, what's important is that they come to faith in Christ. Amen? They come to faith in Christ. Now, along the way, the Holy Spirit is, is telling them, you know what, I want to be a formal member of the church. Well, well, fine, you are welcome here. But we are not forcing people to become members here. Number three, marriage should reflect the care. Not just the cleansing, but the care of Christ for His church. Okay. How? In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Okay. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body. Again, look at this. Just as Christ does the church, for we are members of His body. So we need to say, what Jesus Christ is doing to the church is this. First, He, he bore the cross for us. He's continually cleansing us. And right now, He's caring for us the same way as He cared for His own body. Now, it's really true that women should be treated as part of your body. Okay? Remember in creation? Women were not created out from dirt. Where did God take a portion, a thing for God to, you know, to make a woman? From the, from the side of the man. So we need to say, when we are married, we should treat our wives as what? An extension of our Bodies. Again, somebody told me that in sa, sa J. Paul, I was pastor in Malaysia. Now I know pastor that my, my wife is part of me. She is my excess fan. You know, I should share that, that, that statement tonight. Excess fan. Quite a big one, huh? Excess fan. Okay? Well, that's what the Bible is saying. Okay? You, we have to care fanatic with their with their body build. Okay? So making sure that now we have six packs. Right? Making sure but that's how the Bible describes the love of the man to the woman. Treat the woman as part of your body. Right? Now how? Two ways. Two words used by Paul. One is to nourish them. Now that word to nourish means to bring to maturity. Meaning in marriage, the goal of the spouse is to what? To lead, to bring, to guide, to help the spouse come to his full potential. Amen? In some, in some marriages, it's so sad that the spouse is always putting down the other. But it's wrong in the Bible. When the Bible says, but he cares for her, it means that your wish, my wish, is that Cheryl would reach her full potential. Why? Because if I'm doing that, God is glorified. Amen? It's not me that is glorified, it is God. So the same with us in our marriage lives. Our goal is how can I help my wife or my husband so that she will mature or he will mature in faith in you know in everything and vice versa the other one is to cherish 
Say cherish. Okay? It means to soften with the heat. And it's really talking of physical. Now this is where romance comes in. Wow. You, you love romance, right? Okay, what's your favorite romance? Somebody was asked. What's your favorite romance? My favorite romance is Romance 623. <laughs> All I'm saying is all short of the glory of God, okay? So you're so romantic. So it's in the Bible, romance, okay? So what is what is to cherish? It means to, to give affection. And I know, I know, not all men are that affectionate. It's 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 not true to everyone, right? Who are affectionate men here? It's not affectionate today. Raise your hand. Hello, what are you? Oh, only two. Okay? And both of them are attending my Bible studies Ayala. So, am I, am I teaching you how to be affectionate? Yes. Okay. You know, to be affectionate with our spouse needs some skills. Why? Because again, men, we have this idea that to become affectionate means to be what? To be my you No? No? To be feminine. But that's a wrong teaching. Right? Affection is necessary. Women, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, I think it's in verse 7, women were created by God as the weaker vessels. So because they are weaker, they need what? They need to be handled with care. So mga fragile ang sila. No? Mga fragile. So lahat ng kaboran na sila mga frog. Wala na yung so how can you for her? Treat them like a queen. That's a good example of a happy couple. That's complete nourishing and cherishing. Okay, number four. Marriage also reflects the covenant. Okay? The covenant commitment of Christ to his church, a covenant commitment, okay? We find this when, when Paul said, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Again, in verse 31, he mentions again about a man leaving his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now, what is Paul's talking here? Why we should be faithful to our marriage? Why we should not consider loving another woman or another man? You know why? You know why? Because at the very heart of marriage is the covenant that we make. It's not about feeling in love. Okay? It's not about staying in love. Staying married, therefore, is not just about staying in love. Because after all, that I'm staying in love is just a physical, emotional thing. Now listen, people are so in love with their spouse because of what they can feel, what they can see, or what they can receive from them. And that's normal. But we need to realize that everything human in us is what? Will soon deteriorate, will soon wear off, right? The pretty woman that you used to, you know, like so much will no longer be pretty. Right? The man that you think, you know, is so handsome will soon become not handsome, but, you know, gruesome now. <laughs> so, in other words, physically, we will not be the same. We will change, right? But, but should that mean that because we change, we also change partners? No. Why? Because what sticks together a Christian man and a woman is not just falling in love with each other, but it's the keeping of the covenant of love. Okay? Now let me illustrate that to you. Again, marriage is just a reflection of Jesus, right? And the church. Now question. Did Jesus remain the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes. yes. He remains the same. The Jesus who died on the cross, the Jesus who loved the disciples, the Jesus who fed 5,000, 4,000, the Jesus who healed so many sick people, the Jesus who transformed so many prostitutes and tax collectors is the same Jesus who loves us today. 
question of the church, you and I, are we the same when we first fall in love with Jesus? Are we the same now? Have we maintained our love for Jesus? Yes or no? No. We have not maintained. You see, we are rebellious people. We sin against God. We ignore His teachings. We ignore His word. Even if we hear the sermon, and then the next day we commit that same sin. But question, did Jesus ever leave us? Did Jesus ever say, I don't want you anymore. You don't love me anymore. I, I, I need to look for a new church. Did Jesus abandon us? Did Jesus Christ, you know, divorce us? No. In other words, why? Do you think we are worth that kind of love? Do you think you deserve, do you think I deserve the love of Jesus after every sin that I've committed to him? Do you think I deserve, do you think I'm entitled to it? No. If you think you're entitled to it, you're not only a hypocrite, you are what? You are deceived. Because after all, we are all sinners. We are all sinners, we are just repacked and packaged in a nice way that we look good from the outside. But you know inside how deceitful we are, how selfish we are, how we need, how we need the transforming grace of God, right? But in spite of that, God still holds us. Why? You know why? Because of the covenant we made. Because of the covenant we made. The covenant he made that you will be my people and I will be your God. The covenant that he made that was what? Was uh, sealed by what? Not by a ring. It was sealed by his blood. When Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood for the new and eternal covenant, Jesus Christ was making a vow. That communion was actually like a marriage ceremony. When Jesus says, you don't do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus died on the cross, that sealed the covenant. When Jesus said, it is finished, Jesus said, I do to you and to me. And because of that, because of that, He will never abandon you and me. Amen? And the Bible says, if that's how Jesus and the church works, that should be how men and women should work in the church. It's based on a covenant. So, why should I remain faithful to my wife? Why? Love. Yeah, love. There's love. But it's a covenant of love that I made, you know, 11 years ago. The same thing with you guys. Those of you married. It's a covenant you made. Because that covenant is not just a statement. You know, when you said, I do. When you said, you know, I will love you and care for you and through, you know, through thick and thin, in richer or for poorer, what else? In plenty or in one, and for as long as we both shall live. All heaven was listening to you. And they recorded it. And so the moment, the moment, the moment you destroy that marriage, when you fall in love, with, or when you consider another man or another woman simply because you cannot take it simply because you know the person doesn't deserve your love you broke that covenant okay. on the other side this is what Jesus says when you're a man or you're a woman you know, you're so in love with your wife but then the wife you know God said you know, I don't know, I may stroke. But then she's so sick that she will no longer what? Serve you as the husband. There are things you cannot do. Or maybe the wife is going through a cancer situation and she's dying. But then you as a man, you stood there by your side until she died. For some men, there's a people like that are not need that have potential replacement. But you're a Christian, your wife, you know. She's, she's no longer so beautiful, she's so sick, and she smells so bad. And yet, because you have that covenant, I, I, will, I will be standing with her until she dies. Why? Because I'm in covenant with this woman. See? You know, when you do that, God 
God sees Himself through you. Amen? When you stick, even if the problem is so tough, uh, so tough and you stick to that person until death, you know what? God sees Himself in you. You know why? Because that's what He's been doing for many years. Standing. Amen? Remaining faithful to us. Remember the Bible says, if we are unfaithful, the Bible says He remains faithful. Amen? When you are faithful to your spouse, you are so much like your Lord. That's the reason why we as Christians, we have to be faithful. We have to be faithful no matter what. Till death do us part. For as long as we both shall live. And finally, a spirit-filled marriage remains. Remains. It remains what? It remains faithful to the marriage covenant despite of. Okay? Despite of. For the reason that I already explained. That, that, ma that marriage covenant is a reflection of God's love covenant to His people. That as long as that covenant stands, God will love us. God will not abandon us. Okay? So let me end with three, you know, three practical steps. How, how can I remain faithful to the covenant to your mouth? Number one, keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. For those of you who are just married, maybe your covenant is still fresh, or maybe not. Literally hang it somewhere. Somebody told me this morning, a pastor, ako na ibutan sa CR, ako na ibutan sa dining room. Everywhere, you will find your covenant there. Why? We have to remind ourselves, because the devil is so quick to make us forget. No? When there's beautiful women coming, suddenly you forget that you're married. You what? Yeah. Keep it fresh. Now remind yourself, no? You talk about it. Remind yourself, keep it fresh. Amen? Number two, keep it free. Does it have to be so, you know, organized? You know, have the freedom. To enjoy that covenant with you. And in other words, it doesn't have to be so sophisticated. No, keep it free. And number three, keep it flaming. Okay? Keep it flaming. Look at your spouse now. Is she, is she still hot? <laughs> or literally, can I not so they say to mga atong spouse, more of atong mga spouse, more of atong mga spouse, more of sila ka ng what? More of atong mga food. Most of the time, they, they, they look tasty, yummy, and they taste so spicy. Okay? So put spice. Pastor, but they are old. No! The Bible says, the Bible never says, you know, when you grow old, no more of us. No! Be romantic as long as you can still do it. For as long as you have lips to kiss, for as long as you have hands to touch, keep the flame burning. Amen? Okay, but that's only for the married. Those of you singles, you know, it's safe to play with fire. Amen? And with that, I hope and pray that our marriage will be spirit-filled. Spirit-filled with what? Number one, when we revere Christ as our builder, when we reflect the church and Christ, and when we remain faithful to the marriage vows. Now right now, we come now to the everybody's wedding anniversary. Alright, so I'd like to ask the guys, please put here in front.